All right, so today we want to talk a little about games and social studies, particularly history education. But what you'll find with games and social studies is that most games tend to, to span things like geography, economics, political science, and history, which makes them a really interesting way to think about teaching. Now, uh, among all the areas where we have research on games and learning, social studies is one of the areas where there's the longest tradition. Actually, going back into the 70s, there were a number of games and simulations, uh, oftentimes board games, sometimes mainframe games, um, that were designed for learning. So there's an excellent uh, set of reviews. And if you're interested in this, there's actually a really interesting literature base going back in the 60s and 70s that you can uh, look up and look through a little more in depth. Um, but today, I'm going to talk to you specifically about research with the Civilization series. Now, I spent a good 5 to 20 years of my life playing this game and another 5 to 10 years researching it. Um, we've looked at kids playing Civilization in schools and out of schools, playing as a part of curriculum, playing just for fun. And it's a really interesting kind of test case into thinking about what games can do for learning, how we learn through games, what does it mean to learn something through a game as opposed to, say, a book or a video, and then ultimately, how can we think about designing really powerful learning environments with games? So I got started in this stuff um, around the year 2000, 2001. And at this time, there was very little research on learning through uh, games like Civilization. Um, now, to step back, if you've played Civ, you know this is a game where you're leading a civilization for thousands of years, um, usually roughly 6,000 years from 4,000 BC to the present. And it, it isn't organized like any sort of normal curriculum. Um, so as we started to think about how do you design a curriculum around it, um, we started thinking about uh, what would be the right kind of underlying theoretical framework. And there's this idea of world history that's been coming about for the past uh, two or three decades. And the idea is that one way that we can think about studying history across these broad timescales of thousands of years is through themes and patterns of change, to use Ross Dunn's framework. You know, say rather than just having everyone memorize a giant set of names and dates and a giant set of maps, um, learning to look at world history through different thematic lenses like immigration or population changes. And in this case, um, what we're looking at is using the game Civ to look at the interrelationships between geography and history. So for a couple of years, we ran an after-school program where we tried to do this. We tried to take kids who were struggling in school, who weren't identifying with school, and tried to use civilization as an entree to get them interested in world history, in history, and then in particular into it kind of advanced technology, kind of 21st century skill practices like modding and so on. So in the pre-interviews, these are kids that you would find were not particularly interested in school. So this is one of our students. And, and, and actually, we walked in thinking this might be a good entree to game design. And we were a little surprised to find these were kids who thought game design might be something too hard. And then we followed up and asked, do you like school? Well, I don't really like school unless there's something actually going on. And he kind of you know, talks about sleeping through school. Um, social studies, and I should say as I did this interview and, and reread it today, my inner teacher, I'm a former teacher, I cry a little bit inside because I know I've done activities like this and where he, the things he remembers the most are things like making you know, mountains out of graham crackers and so on. So we built a curriculum, and this was mapped directly to a 6th and 7th grade textbook where they would learn the early civilizations, they learn key geographical features, like where the Nile River is. Um, it was mapped to really specific ideas, so could they um, learn the importance of early trade routes, of military units, um, Nile River Valley, and then walking them up through a series of scenarios. So then they would play as ancient Native American civilizations. One of the goals with this was to help them understand that uh, Native American civilizations were actually much bigger and more robust than they may have realized. Um, and then to start um, asking questions about really what was the size and scope of, say, the Aztec Empire and Incans and so on. Then going through and playing the series in the Iron Age, um, which also maps to a lot of standard curriculum, particularly around ancient civilizations. Um, if any kid had an interest in, say, ancient Greece or ancient Rome, this is the one we wanted to try to kind of loop them in with. And then on to the Industrial Age. Um, something that's interesting about this one is that it gives them the ability to go from, say, horses all the way to tanks within one game, which for some kids is really interesting. And this is also, I should say, in a multiplayer space. So these are all multiplayer games. And the first thing that we found was that making uh, Civ a multiplayer game and playing with groups totally transformed the kind of learning that happened. Um, and the biggest one was that they had to talk to each other, so they started adopting the tools and terminology of the game much more quickly. So kids would start shouting out, hey, what does monarchy do? Do you have monarchy? What does the Great Wall do? These were things that you just, you know, in a few minutes you would hear all of these words being used. Um, and then what they had to do was also debate about, say, the value of each. So if a kid was going to try to tr trade monarchy, for gold, they would have to debate and try to form theories and test them about, say, what the relative value of a technology was. 
Competition then led to a much deeper understanding of the simulation. It's like, say, as a kid's trying to sell the features of monarchy, he would say, well, you want to trade monarchy to help your economy out. So they had to try to develop these sort of causal statements in the process of playing. And then the last thing was that games became a real object for reflection, right? So when someone lost or got trounced, kids would jump up and then immediately try to start understanding what happened and why a kid lost. Or sometimes this was in the form of bragging. You know, I've explained why the kid won. He would explain what his strategy was and maybe how he would use horses or control a particular iron resource as a way to win. But the, the features of competition in particular got them to do the sort of reflection in the process of gameplay. The second thing that jumped out was the roles of mentors, right? So um, immediately what the mentors would start doing is apprenticing them. So one of the, the classic kind of, of activities we would do is really modeling what good gameplay was like, using terminology, coaching kids, uh, providing scaffolding, really the classic kinds of things in the mentoring literature. And then, then of course, there's just question answering. So a lot of the learning that happened was simply answering kids' questions. Now, the most important feature I think that the men mentors did, um, and this is something that we've detailed in the research, was really doing what we called opening trajectories, right? So saying, talking to the kids, identifying an interest, and saying, say, hey, do you want to take this game home? Um, in some cases, we helped them learn to build their own computers so they could play them at home. One kid ended up actually trying to get us to buy him a graphics card on eBay so we could put together a computer. Even saying, well, do you want to know how I made this scenario? and Would you want to learn to make your own? And we, we did um, some really simple civilization tests just to get a sense of some of those factual understandings, just to get a real kind of baseline um, so you can see the kinds of things that kids were learning through playing the game. Um, we also asked them things like, do you like school? Do you like playing Civ? And you can see these kids uh, you know, really did enjoy playing the game. Interestingly, they um, did, even these same kids reported not liking social studies in school, but, but really liking it in, um, outside of school. So in terms of the factual knowledge, this is um, a, a quote from one kid. He just railed off the kinds of things that he had learned. Um, you can get a sense of the different terms in the game. So as this after-school program started to develop, we started to organize it around what we call driving events. So we started holding things like large multiplayer games uh, or competitions that we could use to really drum up participation and get kids involved. One of the things the kids did that we thought was really cool is they had a, a sleepover party the night before one of our games so they could develop a secret strategy to team up and try to beat the grown-ups. Um, after the game, they told us that they actually ha had this sleepover. They actually started studying maps and um, they got maps out kind of like with flashlights and, and had a secret plan to, to try to attack us um, by having a secret outpost on Australia. It didn't work, but it was kind of a cool idea. You know, the idea that you've got kids at home holding sleepovers, studying maps as a way to, to beat their um, the teachers is kind of a cool thing. So um, unique expertise started to develop. Um, this is an interview with one of our kids, Jason. And we, um, this was just in the middle of gameplay, in the middle of class. And he said, all right, Jason, so who are you playing as today? And he said, well, Scandinavia, like always. And he was playing, he loved playing as, as, the, as the Vikings, which we named as Scandinavia in, in this scenario. And he liked getting berserkers. And what he liked to do is put them on galleys and, and um, find any cities close to the shore. We could go off and attack whoever's in the city. So right away, we were really curious. Did he understand that this was, to some extent, re remediating a historical event? So do you think this was like the real Vikings? I said, yeah, actually it was. It's because they had these berserkers who would take the stuff that they made called Wolfbane, like Ivan the Boneless. Now, right away as we're doing this interview, we noticed these are not things that you would necessarily find in the game. So we stopped him to say, all right, where are you learning this stuff? And he said, oh, it's from a book I'm reading. It's a fantasy book, but all the land and stuff's just like real Europe. They have Iceland on the map and long ships. And if you stop for a second and think about that, this is a really interesting phenomenon. So here's a kid um, who earlier said he didn't like history, but through playing civilization, he developed an interest in a particular kind of strategy, in a particular civilization. He's now checking out books from the library. He's developing um, factual knowledge, like where Iceland is on the map. We asked him, does this come from school? He said no, but it's also related to his gameplay. He's doing these kinds of things outside of school for fun. Um, he's also starting to make scenarios around this. So um, because he liked to play as, as um, Scandinavians, uh, he kept finding game after game that he ran into problems like not having enough access to iron or horses. So we started modding the game and then saying, hey, guys, can we play this game today? But in this one, he has you know plenty of horses and iron and things. Um, and so for him, it started as just kind of a way to cheat. But eventually, it, it grew into um, modding and building his own game scenarios. We started to ask him, so what do you think about this historically? Was this kind of thing accurate? 
um, were the Vikings isolated? Were they on an island? You know, is this real or not? And he basically um, says, gives, proceeds to give an answer that's really not too bad, particularly for a, a middle schooler. He says, well, Vikings were up in the Netherlands, and then they controlled Iceland. And I won't read the whole thing. But what's interesting is you read this, you get a sense that he starts to v- develop kind of a micro-narrative of what the causes were. And again, it's really not, not too bad. So as students develop this level of understanding, we started introducing modding tools to see if we could get them to build their own mods and scenarios um, around different ideas. So um, this is what the Civ 3 modding interface looks like, just to give you a sense of it. And we held a modding competition among the kids. Um, This is the winner, and he chose to model the Iraq War. It was kind of an interesting task through Civ. So we had to figure out what kind of events are you trying to depict and what do you want to show with accuracy versus what do you want to leave out. Do you want to have a global map or a regional map? Um, what civilizations are going to be in there? What's even a civilization mean? There's a lot of researching unknowns that went into this. And one thing that I recall vividly is him asking me, you know, Kurt, who's the president of Mongolia? How do they feel about this war? I said, I have no idea. You need to go look that up. And you know, not surprisingly, he had to go online to find this. This isn't something you'd find in your, your book and so on. Um, and it involved um, about 40 hours of work that went into this. And this was eventually kind of our winning mod. So and get a sense of what it looked like and the kind of complexity that went into it. So when you look over the course of um, over the course of this camp, what we see is a process not unlike the trajectory we described at the beginning of the course, where these kids were coming in as newbies. They started developing basic knowledge around where things were on the map, say who the Vikings were. Um, they started developing systemic expertise, right? So what is the the importance of a particular feature on a civilization and how does that change? You know, how does, how does a civilization change um, based on where you are? A desire to mod in some ways to either cheat the game or in the case of Monroe, to, he wanted to show a particular phenomena that eventually grows into d- scenario design and for them, eventually leading their own camps. So they started uh, leading camps and recruiting their friends and kind of running their own game club. By the, by the end of it, we'd actually hired them to run the game club uh, for us when we weren't there. In terms of this program, it took about 40 hours to get to that expert, another 40 hours to get beyond it. And a lot of our work since then has been, how can you really compact that and try to get people up to speed more quickly? So when we think about the educational benefit of something like civilization, it goes way beyond, say, memorizing names and dates. Hopefully you can get that kind of stuff for free. But it's really about developing a new identity as a new kind of person who can do new kinds of stuff in the world. So this is an interview with Monroe, the same one who um, did the the Iraq War mod, and this is actually just a spontaneous moment in, in the after school club. And he, thankfully, we had the tapes rolling. So Monroe says, this game has changed my life. Yep. And the facilitator says, you mean like the scenario I made, this Rome one or Civ? Um, and says, no, no, I mean like the game ever since I started playing Civ. And so he follows up, well, how's it changed your life? I said, well, other video games are boring, but this one isn't. Um, and he says, yeah, his family plays it. So he's, this is a, a student who's taken it home, started building his own computer to play it. He's recruited his family to play it. He built the Iraq War Mod. He, he is a part of his class. He actually um, built a revolutionary war mod and, and turned that in as a class assignment. Um, it, it's really kind of changed some of his family dynamics. He's recruited his brother into the camp. Um, he's got his mom playing. And then he reports that it's changed who he wants to become a senator someday. We said, from playing this game? Now, obviously, I'm not going to you know, claim this is the one and only factor. It may at best be one among many. But it's pretty cool that he looks to this experience as one that's really shaped his identity of who he wants to become and what he, how he wants to live the rest of his life. So we started thinking about this is the kind of thing we possibly could be doing with games, right? So building scenarios that... that um, leverage kids' interest in games, take the intrinsically interesting aspects of games, build them and extend them through academic areas, and then also into non-academic areas um, through cognitively challenging play, but then eventually bridges home in school, right? So the kind of games that kids want to take home and play at home, they want to uh, maybe do extension activities that they turn in as extra credit assignments or as more in-depth research projects, um, but really d- develop deep expertise that is something they can take with them and that can lead to other kinds of interests and other kinds of expertise. Uh, we think of them, and this is uh, this Islands of Expertise idea is, is um, Crowley's idea, but we extend that, we think of them more as centers of expertise because what you want to do is create multiple islands that work together. So through something like Civ, you might get a kid like Jason who becomes fluent in, um, say, Scandinavian history, but then also a modder like um, Monroe, and they could work together to develop different kinds of expertise, and then together they become um, much more powerful than just, say, any sort of isolated island. So when we think about designing games for learning, what we're thinking about is not just the game, but games that 
that build supportive interpretive communities or centers of expertise around them, where kids develop different kinds of skills, different sort of ability to create with them, that build on their intrinsic interest. So a student with an interest in something like alternative history might become school affiliated, right? So they use their interest in CIV as a way to become an expert in history and then go on and kind of become the resident history geek in class. A kid with ancient warfare, we found oftentimes became very interested in game design, right? So if you're interested in, say, the historical importance of the catapult and kind of mod changing mods around that, they might start building games and, and modding games around different eras. Maps and atlases, those are the kids that became interested in politics and geography and maybe someday wanted to become a senator. So the idea is that the game really pulls in these different interests and then sends them out in different directions. And as we think about designing games for learning, one of our challenges is how can we create these kinds of trajectories and pathways through games and then toward other kinds of experiences so they're linked up with different communities and different groups, both inside and outside of school, so they can build their expertise and extend it in new ways and then ultimately become new kinds of people.